So let's continue our lecture on microarchitecture. If you can hear me. Uh, so we're going to continue the single cycle microarchitecture today and then finish off with multi-cycle. It's an exciting topic. Hopefully uh, you'll enjoy it. Okay, so now let's get back to the lecture. Basically, we're going to talk about uh, microarchitecture. We're going to finish multi-cycle microarchitecture. And next week, uh, we're going to do pipelining. So we're going to improve performance from now on every uh, week. Okay, so this is what, this come to, what is to come. And this is where we left off uh, almost last time. We basically designed a simple MIPS uh, single cycle microarchitecture. This is complete single cycle microarchitecture, assuming you omit some instructions, of course. You don't have every instruction in here. Basically, we designed the data path from uh, the fundamental elements, and then we designed every single different type of instruction for the data path. We added the control signals, and this is the data path that can execute the instructions that we essentially added. It's not the complete MIPS architecture, because complete MIPS architectures ha ha have more instructions like this and some other instructions that we didn't really do, but this is a basic MIPS architecture that can execute programs. And you remember the control, basically, you can see that when we decode an instruction, we can get the control signals, and control signals essentially dictate what the data path elements do to the data that's flowing, such that the instruction, as specified by the instruction that architecture, is executed and takes effect as the programmer expects. Right? Clearly, these control signals and the data path elements are not visible to uh, the programmer, not all of them at least. The memory is clearly visible, PC is clearly visible, right? Okay, so we're gonna have some more fun with it. Basically, we, worked, we, we designed the data path, we added the control signals, and for your machine to work, you need to have both, the data path and the control logic. And we were uh, talking about hardwired control, right? single cell hard, hard, uh, hardwired control. Essentially, we do control based on uh, the instruction. Basically, you look at the instruction at memory locations specified by the PC, and you get some bits, that's 32 bits, and you decode these instructions to generate the control signals. Right? And then we were looking at, this was the slide we were looking at last, uh, we basically have eight different control signals, there are four here, and there are four in this slide, and you can go back to the figure and find that there's four of them. These are single bit control signals, as you can see these two bits, PC source one and PC source two, together control the uh, four, four to one mux. You can think of four to one mux as two, two to one muxes also, right? Okay, uh, so what, should, what else should I say over here? So we discussed, for example, if you want to, uh, uh, yeah, let's take, a look at, uh, let's take a look at something different. For example, mem writes control signal. Once you have the control signals, once you have your data path, you need to decide when these control signals should be set. Uh, mem writes control signals should be set if the opcode is uh, store word. Otherwise, it should be disabled, should be set to zero, right? It's obvious. Mem read, is exactly the opposite. If the opcode is load word, the memory should be set, uh, and it, otherwise it should be uh, otherwise it should be disabled. Right. So basically, you go through every single instruction and decide how these signals should be set. And now, essentially, you have the control logic. So if you look over here, these equations. Let me go to the previous slide. These equations describe the hardware that you need to put uh, as logic, as combinational logic, to generate each control signal. Right. Regdes is uh, essentially a comparator. Uh, a zero checker for the opcode, right? You take the opcode, if it's equal to zero, regdes is set to one, otherwise it's set to zero. So basically we've designed the hardware. Now, now the next step is basically uh, implementing these as gates, but we're not going to do that. You know how to do that, going from a Boolean equation like this to, uh, uh, to gates, right? So the, the interesting control signal, the really interesting control signal is here, which is not just dependent on the opcode as you can see, uh, basically, you, uh, this control signal is PC source two, whether the PC gets program counter plus four, or does it get the branch target address that's coming from uh, the branch ca target calculation logic. If the opcode is uh, a conditional branch, BXX, BEQ, BNE, BGT, for example, uh, and the branch condition is satisfied, meaning the branch is taken, that comes from the ALU output, then the signal is set which means that this signal is dependent on not just the opcode, but also what's happening in the data path at this point. So there will be some control signals that are like this, and these control signals are usually, uh, can get in your critical path, because this signal is, uh, B condition is satisfied, brand condition is satisfied, it's coming out of the ALU after comparison of two registers, 
That takes time. And essentially, this control signal is one of the hardest ones to generate. It takes time to generate that control signal. So if you're designing, optimizing for a critical path, you should watch out for these control signals that are generated based on what's happening in the data path at this point. Opcode is easy. When you, get the, when you get the instruction out of the instruction memory, you can decode the opcode and figure out uh, the control signal. So this is a really easy control signal to generate. It basically is a decoder, right? You check whether the opcode is load word compared to uh, load word opcode. Okay, so uh, ALU control, uh, you need to do the ALU control also. That was not one of the control signals over here, but basically uh, you decide what ALU should do based on the opcode again in this case. For example, if the opcode is zero, you select the operation based on the funct bits. Remember the funct bits, function bits. Uh, these are R type operations, as if you remember. Uh, if ALU, uh, or you could, um, uh, if, if the opcode is immediate uh, ALU opcode, then you select the operation according to the opcode. If it's load word or store word, the ALU does addition so that you can calculate the address. Uh, and if it's branch, then you use the branch condition generate, generation function depending on what kind of branch it is. If it's branch equal, you do subtraction. Actually, you usually do subtraction, but there's some other logic that you need to add to check whether it's equal, greater than, or less than. And all, otherwise, you have a don't care. This is how you get don't cares, for example. If you're doing some other operation that doesn't need the ALU, you have a don't care, and you know that you can use the don't cares to minimize the logic. In this case, you can minimize the control logic. Okay, there are a bunch of example ALU operations that you have over here, which we're not gonna talk about. So now that we have our data path and control logic, and we know how to generate control signals, let's have, fun, have some fun with it. Once you have a processor like this, now we can have some fun with it and see which control signals we, we enable. Yes? Because if you remember how we designed the data path, uh, when you calculate the address in load word, you take the base register plus sign extended immediate at the bottom, and the ALU does addition of those. And we will see that again over here. So let's control this. We're gonna take a look at a bunch of instructions. Now we've designed the complete system. Let's, let's see what kind of control signals we enable. So R type ALU operations. Basically these are the control signals that you enable. What's an R type ALU? You need to read source registers. Well, that's done through the instructions over here. And you need to decide what is the destination register. So destination register comes from bits 15 through 11. So this control signal should indicate that this input to the MUX should be connected to the destination register. We are gonna to write to the register in the end, right? Uh, uh, and our type ALU uh, works on two register operands as sources. So this MUX should select this second register and this, there's no MUX to control over here. So if you basically do something to the two registers and that something is specified by this funct bits coming out of the ALU op over here. And do no harm to memory because we're not, it's not a memory operation. So we don't read the memory, we don't write to memory. And the result should come from the ALU result because this is an ALU operation as you can see. The result should come from the output of the ALU and it should be routed to the right data as you can see. So this MUX should select uh, the ALU result uh, as its input and pass it. Okay, so that's what happens here. And our type ALU doesn't change control flow, so you should really get PC plus four to the PC, right? You increment the PC basically by four, and to be able to do that, you need to set this control signal to zero such that this MUX selects PC plus four, and you need to set this control signal to zero also such that this MUX also selects PC plus four coming out of this MUX. Make sense? So that's how you set the control signals once you've designed the data path. So if you're given a data path and given a specification of an instruction and given uh, this complete thing, you should be able to set the control signals very easily uh, depending on what the instruction does. So this is R type ALU. So I'm gonna move to I type ALU so you should see the differences. So this is I type ALU. So it's very slightly different, right? Basically R type ALU uh, adds two register operands, stores the result in a register. I type ALU adds one register to a sign extended immediate and stores the result in a register. So most things should be similar, except the second operand is a sign extend immediate. So I'm gonna switch between these two, R type, I type, R type, I type. Yeah, not much changes. So basically, the second operand uh, is a sign extend immediate coming from over here, and the destination register is specified by these bits over here. And we've already seen these actually, we're just controlling it again. Okay, let's switch to load word. Load word is actually kind of like an I type instruction, and that's how we built the data path if you remember. So very little will change when I switch to load word. Are you ready? That's it. <laughs> so this was I type ALU. 
and this is very little that changes when I go to load work, right? Basically, I still write to a register because the load result goes into a register. Load word calculates its address, and the destination register is the same as an I-type destination register. I still calculate the address very similarly to an I-type operation, base, base register plus sign extend immediate. So address calculation is, this part is essentially the same. In this case, I do an add, because I-type is very, uh, you, you decide based on the opcode, but in load word, you have to add so that you get the address. And this is the part that changes, basically. I do a memory read, and the data that's going into the destination register should come from uh, the memory itself. So that's how we set the control signal. So let me go back. I type, load word. It's fun, right? Store word is going to be similar to load word, but slightly different. Basically, what you can expect that we're going to switch this to one and switch this to zero, right? And this will not matter because we're not going to write to a destination register. But the address calculation will be the same, and this should be zero. And I already said everything. And again, it doesn't matter what this is. This is X means it's uh, don't care because we're not writing to a destination register in store work, right? Okay, so let's have some more fun with branches. I'll do conditional branch, not taken. So this is a not taken conditional branch. Basically, conditional branch doesn't write to a register, doesn't write to memory, doesn't read from memory. So all these control signals that control register and memory reads and writes are, uh, well, writes are zero and read memory is zero also. So a conditional branch, what it does, it calculates a condition so you need to be able to, uh, and it basically compares two registers. So the second register input is connected over here, and you basically check the branch condition. Branch condition comes from the instruction, as you can see. Uh, and, and these are don't cares because we don't write to a register. And basically, uh, this is a not taken branch. I had to specify it. If it's a not taken branch, what happens is branch condition evaluates to zero, so it gets a zero out of here in this uh, end, because what, what this is checking is if this is a conditional branch, and the branch condition evaluates to uh, one. Only then you should choose the target address from here. In this case, I already said it's not taken, so this should be zero, so you get PC plus four, and because it's a conditional branch, you should really connect this input uh, to the program count. So basically, as I said earlier, some control signals are dependent on the processing of data, and this is where you generate the control signal uh, for the branch condition. Okay, let's take a look at not uh, taken branch. This is not taken. A taken branch differs only in this mux, basically, right? Basically, taken branch uh, has to select the bottom input to the mux, which comes from the PC plus sign extended sh left, shift, uh, left, left shifted immediate. That's the target address. Okay, so hopefully this is fun. And jump is uh, actually, jump is unconditional jump. It's actually even easier. You don't really do anything in this part of the pipeline, as you can see, because what jump does is it calculates address, and the address calculation is over here, and it's an unconditional jump, so you should really, uh, well, actually, jump address is calculated here. I'm sorry, this is the conditional branch address. Jump address is calculated here, uh, bottom 26 bits of the instruction shifted left by two, concatenated with the program counter's top four bits, and then you do that, and then you just need to select that to be input into the PC, and all of the other data path elements should do no harm, meaning you don't write to a register, you don't write to memory, you don't read from memory, and as a result, you get zeros over here and don't cares over here. Make sense? So when you're executing a jump, you, you might, uh, I'll foreshadow a little bit. Now, when you're executing a jump, most of the hardware that you built is idle, actually, right? It's doing nothing. You're just using this part of the data path. So you may start thinking, oh, can we use that for something else? And we'll see that we can use that for something else when we see next week's lecture and the week after. Okay, so we're done basically. I've just simulated the machine for you. Uh, let me go quickly how you can actually generate these control signals. We generated these control signals using combinational logic that was hardwired control, and I gave you the equation. So you can actually completely uh, build this machine right now. Uh, and I already said this actually. Uh, this is necessary in a single cycle microarchitecture actually. You have to generate the control signals uh, combinationally. But there is another way of generating control signals in a pipeline machine, for example, or in a multi-cycle machine. Uh, you can also have a memory structure that contains the control signals associated with an instruction. So you take the instruction, you address memory, and you get the control signals. The eight control signals I showed you, you get all eight of them by accessing some memory structure, separate memory, specialized memory just for storing control signals. And your book covers this. I'm not going to cover this in detail. This is called a control store. And it's not clearly, actually, it's, it's not shown here, but it could potentially go into here, but there are complications of doing that in a single cycle machine. 
Okay. Uh, so uh, this is the complete single cycle processor we have. Let me go through the other single cycle processor, which is going to look very similar. This is actually in your readings. Uh, and uh, there are also some backup slides that I have as, uh, that build upon these. If you're interested, uh, you, can, you can look at the backup slides to reinforce your readings. It's actually very similar to your reading. So this is the uh, single cycle processor that you have in your readings. And as you can see, it looks very similar, right? You have a control unit that takes the instruction and that has essentially uh, the same control signals almost. There's a PC source that's missing over here because it doesn't have the jump over here in this case. Uh, but you have eight control signals again and they're named very, very similarly as you can see. Uh, okay, and this is the zero condition because this is basically looking at branch equal to zero. So you can go through this on your own, but I'm gonna give you one example of building this uh, with the load word, just like we started uh, with our, uh, we didn't start with load word, but uh, just like uh, we did uh, while we were building uh, the previous machine. So basically you, do, you definitely need these components, program counter, instruction memory, register file, data memory, and you go through the same steps. Fetch the instruction, you input the PC into instruction memory, you get the instruction. The second step, the instruction bits are input into uh, the register file so that you read the operands. In this case, in load word, you need only one operand, the base register. And the second one comes from the sign extend immediate, similarly to what we had in the previous processor. And then you add them in the next step to compute the memory address. And you need to have a control signal over here. You get the ALU result, feed it into the uh, data memory, that's essentially your address, and you read the data. In this case, it's a bit simpler because the memory doesn't really have a read enable bit or memory read bit. That's okay. It depends on what kind of memory you're dealing with in the end. And then you need to set this reg write signal so that uh, you write to the destination register and the destination register ID is coming from uh, uh, these bits, as you can see, as specified by the I type instruction. So there's no magic. It's, if you're implementing a MIPS machine, single cycle, it's going to look similarly to this. And then of course, don't forget, increment the program counter. That's step six. Even though we show this as steps, this is all happening concurrently, right? Like this increment is happening concurrently with whatever I showed you earlier. While the data is flowing through the memory into the destination register, this increment is happening to increment the PC. Okay, so you can have some fun with it. If you already read the book, you'll see these figures are very similar. And of course, if you have a data path like this, now you also need to generate the control signals. So Usually, it's a good idea to uh, write a table that looks like this, uh, based on the instruction, based on the opcode. These are the control signals uh, that you need to set. These are how you need to set the control signals. Right? For example, if it's an R-type instruction, you need to write to a register, uh, and the destination comes from one part of the MUX. Uh, this is uh, which, which, which register ID you select, basically. Uh, and these are different control signals that you need to be set. Right? So clearly jump control signal is set only when you have a jump. And as you can see, everything else is do no harm. Don't write to memory, don't write to registers. And everything else is uh, no op, uh, not no op. Uh, I don't care because you, uh, you don't use that part of the data path uh, where these control signals control. Okay, and this is the complete single cycle MIPS processor that's very similar, that's directly from your book. So clearly you have, you should read the book and the lecture slides, but it's going to be uh, hopefully easy. Okay, so this is a single cycle microarchitecture we developed in lectures. This is a single cycle microarchitecture I kind of showed you in your readings. It's essentially very similar. Let's evaluate this. So now we're gonna do some performance analysis and understand how this fares. So let me ask you the question, is this a good idea? Is this a good design you think? Any, any guesses? Yes. It depends on the situation. I like your answer. It depends is usually a good answer. <laughs> when is this a good design? <laughs> so you answered it correctly. <laughs> now it's a harder question, yes. Exactly, yes. When all operations have more or less the same time, and hopefully that time is short, this may be a good design. Well, I guess you could we were uh, complimented and say when operations take wildly different times, this is probably a bad design. And unfortunately, that's the reality. The reality is that operations take wildly different times. So we're gonna try to design a better microarchitecture. But before that, we'll, let's analyze the performance of it. 
So basically, I've already given you the basic performance equation, but we're going to go into a bit more detail. Uh, essentially, uh, if you want to get the performance of a program, uh, you know how many instructions you execute, which instructions you execute, uh, and we're going to use that as a basis for finding the execution time of the program. So clearly, instructions are executing on the hardware. They can take one or more clock cycles to complete. In a single cycle microarchitecture, taking every instruction takes one clock cycle. But I already introduced the concept of multi-cycle, where each instruction can take multiple clock cycles. So we're going to be even more general in this performance analysis. So we're going to have the cycles per instruction metric that basically says how many cycles an instruction takes. Then we also have the clock cycle. How long does a clock cycle take, right? And as you know, that's determined by how much time one cycle requires. That's the clock period. And clock frequency is essentially one over the clock period. That's the inverse. Or you can think of it as how many cycles can be done each, in each second, right? So as a general formula, you have n instructions in a program. And each instruction takes CPI cycles, or an average instruction takes CPI cycles. And the maximum clock speed of the processor is f. So the clock uh, period is uh, t, 1 over f. So this is the equation that I showed you earlier, right? Basically, you have the number of instructions times cycles per instruction times t, which is the clock period. And that gives you how long the program takes. That's the performance equation. Some people call it the iron law of performance. And I've already given you this slide before. You can, this, you can think of the execution time of the instruction as cycles per instruction times the clock cycle time. You take some number of cycles, and uh, each cycle takes uh, some amount of time. You multiply them, and you get the execution time of the instruction. If you want to get the execution time of the program, you sum over all of the instructions you execute this value for each instruction. Nothing, uh, nothing surprising, hopefully. Of course, uh, this is uh, summing over everything may be uh, slow, so sometimes people look at the average cycle per instruction uh, that you have in a program, because you can actually look at the program, which instructions you've executed, and figure out how many, what fraction of the load you executed, what fraction of the ads you've executed, what fraction of the stores you've executed. And for each of them, you know how many cycles it should take, and then you average across them uh, how many cycles per instruction you're supposed to take, and multiply it by the number of instructions, and multiply it by the clock cycle time. So let's analyze our single cycle design. We're going to look at uh, the clock cycle time. Clearly, the CPI will be one, right, in a single cycle microarchitecture. Yes? Uh, could you say it again? Average? Because you, you're, you're really looking at all of the instructions, right? So each instruction has a cycle per instruction. Uh, you don't need to average it. You can do the sum. But if you think about this, these equations are the same, right? So if you have 50% uh, uh, loads and 50% adds, and a load takes six cycles, and an ad takes two cycles, the average is four cycles per instruction because you have 50%, 50% mix. <laughs> Makes sense, right? <laughs> This can sometimes simplify if you know the mix of the instructions in the system. OK, so let's uh, look at the single cycle design. Remember, single cycle design, average CPI, or CPI for every instruction is just one, right? We don't have any freedom. So our performance is really determined by the clock cycle time and number of instructions. Assume that we don't have control over number of instructions. The compiler gave you instructions to execute. Clearly, if you want to improve the performance of your program, you may want to reduce the number of instructions, all else being equal, right? So a good compiler actually tries to do that. If, and if, if instructions are not uh, doing useful work, you may want to get rid of them, right? But that's out of the scope of what we're going to analyze. OK, I already said this. CPI is strictly one. Uh, and how long each instruction takes is determined by how long the slowest instruction takes to execute, even though many instructions do not lead that, uh, need that long to execute. So a clock cycle time of the microarchitecture is determined by how long it takes to complete the slowest instruction, as we discussed. Uh, because the critical path of the design is determined by that. So uh, what is the slowest instruction to process? We're going to discover that in our microarchitecture. So all six phases of the instruction processing cycle take a single machine clock cycle to complete. And we're going to go through these six phases. But we're going to uh, do that uh, based on the microarchitecture. I'm going to give you some numbers. Basically, the question is, do each of the above phases take the same time for all instructions, same latency? And the answer is no. Uh, like decoding may take much shorter uh, uh, than fetch, because fetch requires an access uh, to memory structure, the instruction memory, right? Evaluating an address 
may take some time because it requires an addition. Uh, executing, depending on what you execute, may take different amounts of time based on the instructions. Uh, storing results, you write to the register file. So basically, that all happens in the pipeline. It really depends on the logic design uh, that you have underneath. So I'm going to give you some numbers that I cook up. These are not necessarily real numbers, clearly. Uh, but basically, we're going to assume for this design that we developed in the previous lecture and today, uh, these are the times that we take. So we're going to assume memory units, uh, instruction memory or data memory, read or write, doesn't matter. It takes about 200 picoseconds. ALU operation and adders take about 100 picoseconds. Register file read or write takes 50 picoseconds because register file is smaller than memory. And magically, I'm going to assume that other combination logic is zero picoseconds, but you know better based on the timing and verification lecture that's not true. But I'm going to simplify the analysis. That's the reason I take zero picoseconds. In real life, you have to take into account the critical path completely, including all the combination logic. And these numbers are not necessarily realistic also, clearly. Uh, data memory may take longer than instruction memory, depending on how you design it. And we will see that uh, toward the end of uh, the class. Uh, the, the choices you make in memory depends, uh, affects your latency. Okay, now uh, basically, uh, this, is, this table shows the different types of instructions we've seen, and what stages do they go through, do they spend time in, and how long it takes to execute each instruction. So if you do this right, and I'm going to show you how to do it right in the next few slides. The load work uh, instruction goes through all of the parts of the single cycle machine. Basically, you need to fetch the instruction, you need to decode the instruction, access the register file, you need to calculate the address through the ALU, you need to access memory, and you need to write the data coming out of memory into the register file. That's the only instruction that takes, uh, that basically has to go through the combinational elements through uh, the entire machine, and it takes 600 picoseconds in this case. That's the longest. And if you look at jump, as I showed you in the previous pictures, jump does nothing but calculate the target, well, you need to fetch it, of course, uh, and you need to calculate the target address. Well, I kind of ignored it here because it's combination logic. Ca the calculation is really fast because you concatenate the bottom 26 bits uh, shifted left with the top four bits of the instruction. So it, I'm assuming it takes zero picoseconds, so this is actually 200 picoseconds. So clearly there's a wide divergence. Jump takes 200 picoseconds, and load work takes 600 picoseconds. So your cycle time has to be 600 picoseconds at least. Right. Okay, so let's find the critical path for these different instructions. I'll do R type and I type ALU, they go through a similar critical path. Basically I showed you the table, now we're gonna construct the table. Basically the, uh, the R type and I type ALU operations need to be fetched, need to access the register file, need to go through the ALU. They don't go through the memory, so you bypass the memory, so you don't incur the delay over here. But you need to write the results into the re uh, destination register, so you add up the latencies of all those components to get 400 picoseconds over here. Now that's not enough for critical path analysis because there's something else also happening for this instruction, which is PC gets PC plus four, but based on the assumptions we have, the adder takes 100 picoseconds, the muxes are free for us because I just said so, it's combination logic, it's zero picoseconds, in real life it's not true. Uh, but basically this takes 100 picoseconds. So the critical path for the R-type and I-type uh, ALU instructions is 400 picoseconds, as you can see over here. So that's how you do the critical path analysis uh, of your design. Load word, this is the hard part. And usually actually in real systems also, load word is a pain. Whenever you're doing load from memory, it takes long. And there's no surprise here, this takes long in this simple machine also. So again, we do the same analysis, load word needs to go through the instruction memory, uh, read the registers, calculate address through the ALU, read memory, write the result into the registers file, so you get 600 picoseconds over here, and concurrently, PC is being incremented in 100 picoseconds, so load word's critical path is 600 picoseconds. Store word, similar, but not as slow, Although it's close. Basically, store word needs to go through all of these stages, calculate the address, and write the data into the memory. But it doesn't write stuff into the register file. As a result, it's only 550 picoseconds. It's not, uh, it doesn't determine your cycle time as a result. Branch taken is actually much faster, as you can see. So uh, basically, uh, critical path analysis here is a bit harder. 
because uh, it turns out the critical path goes through the branch condition determination logic. So this is where you determine the branch condition uh, by going through fetching the instruction, reading the registers, comparing them, uh, figuring out the branch condition. That takes about 350 picoseconds. Of course, the, another critical path could be uh, the determination of the uh, uh, target address, right? So that's PC plus four, you go through this adder, 100 picoseconds, and then plus sign extended left shifted immediate, that's another adder, 200 picoseconds, but that becomes stable to, after 200 picoseconds, the branch condition becomes stable after 350 picoseconds, so clearly this red part is your critical path, okay? In a conditional branch. Okay, so hopefully that's uh, simple. Jump is the easiest. Uh, still, analysis may be not so easy. Basically, you, you, uh, you need to fetch the instruction and you need to figure out, uh, this is the instruction fetch, it takes about 200 picoseconds. And because I assume that uh, combination logic has zero delay, uh, what happens is uh, uh, this mux has zero delay. Uh, so uh, the, 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 this, basically, uh, the, the decoding signal that says jump over here, it's over here actually, jump over here, becomes stable after 200 picoseconds, and that is input to this MUX. The other inputs to the MUX, uh, this doesn't matter, because you're definitely selecting this input in a jump. This input you're not selecting in a jump. So you need to check whether this input, when this input becomes stable, and that becomes stable, that's PC plus four. This logic doesn't have any delay because of the magic I introduced. So this is 100 picoseconds. 200 picoseconds is longer than 100 picoseconds. As a result, jump's critical path is 200 picoseconds. Right. Okay, so we've done critical path analysis for essentially all of the instructions right now. And we figured out uh, uh, load word is the slowest one. Okay, let me talk about control logic a little bit. I've kind of ignored combination logic, but you should really take into account combination logic delays. And also control logic delays could be uh, significant as well, depending on how long it takes. So in this case, for example, if, if this takes about 200 picoseconds, that's going to affect your cycle time clearly. And this could be large depending on how complex your instructions are. In MIPS, instructions are not that complex. You basically look at opcode and function, different, very simple parts of the instruction, and you basically build a simple decoder. But in x86, for example, instructions are very complex. In MIPS, we know that the opcode is um, the top six bits, right? Of course, you have functions sometimes, but that's uh, easy. In, in x86, the opcode can be anywhere between one to 16 bytes. So it could be actually huge. Actually, and, sorry, an instruction could be anywhere between one to 16 bytes. And the way you do the decoding is a serial decoding process. You first look at the top byte, and then that tells you whether you need another byte. And then that may tell you whether you need a, a few other bytes. So the decoding is actually more complex in some ISAs. MIPS is beautiful, RISC-V is beautiful in that sense because the decoding is simple. So basically, the key question is, can control logic be on the critical path? And it can, actually. If you have a complex ISA, that you, where you need to do the decoding slowly because the decoding depends on many other things that you fetch, it could take a long time. For example, in, in an earlier machine, Control Data uh, Corporation, this is actually a, a company that was competing with IBM in the 1960s. This is the first company that actually built an out of order execution machine uh, before IBM did. Uh, and they, they actually did a great job. Uh, but the previous machine to that, uh, uh, they had control store access that took too long. They basically had this control store based memory and the access took too long as a result, this was determining their critical path. Now in the next machine they fixed it of course. So it's, it's certainly possible that control logic uh, affects your critical path. In a good design, you should make sure that your control logic doesn't affect your critical path. And I think in good designs in general, this should not be the case. Okay, so let's go back to the slowest instruction to process. Uh, we said load word is the slowest instruction, but the problem is actually even worse than that, right? It's, memory is not magic. We assume magic memory, if you remember. Uh, and we're assuming that you basically access this memory, get the data. In real systems, that's not the case. Memory can take much longer to access. And we will see this when we get to the memory uh, lectures at the end. Sometimes it may take 100 milliseconds to access. Sometimes you may need to access the disk, right? Uh, well, 100 milliseconds is actually too much if you actually access a lot of disks over there. But in today's systems, memory takes about 50 to 100, 150, 200 nanoseconds. Uh, that's not good still. Uh, okay, but in this case, I guess in the scale we have, uh, 
uh, in, uh, yeah, it could, it could take much longer, actually, because there's, uh, the data may be anywhere on the disk, right? So the question is, does it make sense to have a simple register to register at or jump to take the same amount of time the longest instruction takes to access? And the answer should be no by now. Uh, and what if you need to access memory more than once to process an instruction? That's actually true. Uh, actually, which instructions need this? How many instructions? Uh, yes? That's right. If you have a load indirect, you need to access memory once and then memory twice. That's right. Actually, this is a bit of a trick question because all instructions need to access memory once. The instruction memory, right? Basically, you cannot get away without a memory access. You need to fetch the instruction, and that actually uh, requires a memory access. And if that, that takes a long time, you're in trouble, right? This is why the single cycle microarchitecture actually doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm going to skip the multiple ports part. Uh, because it's really contrived in the end. It's, it looks simple. You have a single cycle design, but it's, it's not very realistic. Why? Because all instructions run as, slow, uh, as slow as the slowest instruction. So it violates a bunch of principles that we're going to discuss. It's inefficient because of the same fact. All instructions run as slow as the slowest instruction, whereas an ad takes, well, I don't remember the slide before, but let's say 300 uh, picoseconds in our design. Why should you slow it down to be 600 picoseconds, like a load word? And load word sometimes takes much longer. Why should you slow it down to be as slow as the slowest instruction? And in addition to this, you need to provide worst case combinational resources in parallel as required by any instruction. Because you're doing everything in a single cycle, you need to have the machinery, the data path elements that are required to execute the instruction in one cycle. That's why we have a bunch of adders and a bunch of different ALUs. Uh, well, AL, uh, adder is a special case of ALU. Uh, so your hardware actually increases. Okay, so you need to replicate a resource if it's needed more than once by an instruction during different parts of the instruction processing cycle. That's why we have an instruction memory and a data memory. You don't necessarily have to have that. Uh, also, that's not necessarily the simplest way to implement an ISA. Uh, there, if you have especially complicated instructions, this is something that is recommended in your homework, repeat MOS is a string copy instruction in x86. So the instruction, what it does, the specification is, you have a count register uh, in, e in x86 terms, it's ECX, and you basically, uh, you have a source pointer to a memory location, and you have a destination pointer to another memory location, the specification of the instruction is that copy, uh, starting from the source pointer to the memory location, copy one byte from that source pointer to the destination pointer, and do this copy as many times as indicated by the count. So you do one byte copy, increment the source pointer and the destination pointer, decrement the counter, check if the counter is zero, if not, you keep, doing, you keep doing copying. So if the counter is one million, you basically copy one million bytes from one location to another location in memory. It's essentially a string copy supported by the instruction set architecture. And this instruction exists. It's actually, if you have an x86 processor, which is actually in here, it's, it does these, and it's a very powerful instruction. You can basically copy huge amounts of data from one location in memory to another location. Now the question is, does it make sense to implement this in a single cycle? Well, first of all, how do you actually do it? It's, it's, it's also a very interesting question. It's very difficult to do it in a single cycle. But assuming you could do it, it would be a very, very long clock cycle, right? Okay? Okay. So, so, so other instructions exist. Index is also an in instruction that was uh, present in WAX machines. Essentially, it's a multi-dimensional index into uh, arrays. So you basically index into, let's say, a three-dimensional array. So you do multiple memory access. It's not as bad as the string copy that I said, but it's still... It still takes a long time. So it's not easy to optimize. Uh, so, okay, uh, this is not the necessarily the simplest way to implement an ISA because if you take multiple cycles to do this copy, it's a lot easier to implement. So also, it's not easy to optimize or improve performance with single cycle microarchitecture because you don't have a lot of freedom, right? Uh, so there may be some common instructions. You may be executing ads. You may optimize the ads. But so what? It doesn't matter because you're limited by the longest instruction to process. So it doesn't matter how much effort you put, you really need to reduce the time it takes to uh, execute the longest instruction, which is a very, a very difficult thing to do. So you need to optimize the worst case all the time. So basically, a single mic cycle microarchitecture violates all of these design principles. Let me give you the design principles. There are three key design principles in uh, microarchitecture. One is critical path design. 
you want to, if you want to maximize performance, you would like to maximize the clock frequency, which means that you would like to reduce the clock cycle as much as possible, which means that you need to find and decrease the maximum combination logic delay. And this dictates that if you have too long of a logic delay, it's better to break it into multiple cycles. So a single cycle microarchitecture clearly doesn't do that. The other design principle is common case design. So if your machine is executing lots of ads, you should really optimize the ads. And optimizing the ads should improve performance. In a single cycle machine, it doesn't, because ad is not on the critical path, right? And bread and butter or common case design says that you should, whenever you're designing something, you should spend them time and resource on where it matters the most. So if the machine is designed to execute a lot of ads, you should do that. It should not be limited by like a division. Actually, we didn't talk about division, but division can actually lengthen your critical path also. So it's really important to think about common case versus uncommon case. And also, uh, balance design is a key principle as well. Uh, you, we want to balance instruction data flow through hardware components. And we want to design to eliminate bottlenecks, balance the hardware for the work. So if you look at the execution of jump in the single cycle microarchitecture, you use this part of the uh, uh, design uh, data path, and all of the other parts remain idle. Now the question is, is this a balanced design? Whenever you're executing a jump, this huge part of the machine is idle, so you're, it's a waste. Similarly, you can go through every single instruction and find some parts of the machine that's idle. Right? Okay, so essentially, uh, single cycle microarchitecture doesn't do well in light of these principles. It essentially violates all of them. Uh, let me cover the system design principles and that'll be a good place to stop. Uh, this is actually important. Whenever you're designing computer systems and architectures, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to follow good principles. And remember the principle designed from our first lecture, right? Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, a famous architect, as architecture should be based upon principle and not upon precedent. And I agree with that quite a bit. And if you remember, if he was designing something based on what came before, he would design something like this, maybe it's okay but he instead designed something much more out of the box and much more creative. And people go there, uh, this is falling water, and visit that. And also this is taught in architecture classes. But there are other system design principles, so we'll continue to cover them in this course. Uh, and I will give you some references. These could be very useful references for whatever you do in the future, actually. That's one. Uh, this is Mike Flynn's paper. It's, very, it's a bit hard to read. Uh, Amdahl's paper, you're hopefully reading it. And I will actually talk about Butler Lampson in the next slide, and then we're going to take a break. Uh, so I would recommend uh, this hints for computing system design, uh, computer system design is actually a very nice overview of principles for computer systems. So a key, key system design principle is keeping it simple, actually. A simple design is usually better than a more complex design. And you probably know who said this. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. Anybody who guesses who said this? If you look at the picture, you probably guess who that is, right? <laughs> and keeping it low cost is also important. Uh, so an engineer is actually a person who can do for 10 cents a dime what any fool can do for a dollar, right? <laughs> That's another system design principle. And actually, uh, single cycle microarchitecture violates both of these. And if you want to see more system design principles, I would definitely recommend uh, this paper that was written in 1983, and that's still very relevant today. Butler Lampson is another Turing Award winner uh, based on the personal computers he designed early in the 1960s. Uh, he won the Turing Award. Okay, so it's a very good place to take a break, and we'll go deeper into multi-cycle microarchitecture than the rest of the lecture. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, now you know the idea of single cycle microarchitecture and you have a complete design. You also know the idea of multi-cycle microarchitecture and I, I think I've already given you why it's important, but let's go over it uh, a little bit more. Uh, so essentially the goal of a multi-cycle microarchitecture is to let each instruction take only as much time as it really needs. That'd be ideal of course, but we have overheads in terms of register latching as you know, set up and hold times for example. So we're going to take, uh, make this close to only as much time as it really needs, as opposed to every instruction taking as long as uh, the longest instruction. So the idea is very simple. Uh, we want to determine the clock cycle time independently of the instruction processing time. Uh, and each instruction will take as many clock cycles as it needs to take, uh, which means that we need to have multiple states or multiple clock cycles uh, per instruction. So we're, we're gonna build a finite state machine that transitions 
from state to state, and the states will be different for different instructions. If you think about the single cycle machine, it is a single cycle, right? Uh, you, you, you basically determine your control signals combinationally, but you really uh, transition between state to state, but the states that you take uh, for each instruction is essentially the same. It's only, it only happens in a single cycle, depending on the instruction mites. But now we're gonna take different states for different instructions. I already said this. And this slide I've already shown you actually. Basically, uh, if you remember the process instruction step in the ISA, the ISA specifies abstractly what the architectural state prime should be given an instruction and the current architectural state. And uh, essentially it's an abstract finite state machine. Uh, state is a programmable visible state and the next state logic is instruction execution specification. And from the ISA point of view, there are no intermediate states between AS and AS prime. So you have one state transition per instruction from the ISA point of view. Uh, but as in microarchitecture, we know that there are many choices in implementation. As long as, uh, uh, basically we can do multiple state transitions per instruction. So this is a single cycle machine. We've seen this slide before actually. You go from architectural state to architectural state prime in one single cycle. A multi-cycle machine does this. You go into an intermediate state in one clock cycle, go into another intermediate state in another clock cycle, another intermediate state in another clock cycle, and eventually the instruction is done, then you per uh, change the architectural state to architectural time at this point. So you take multiple clock cycles to transform AS to AS prime. So this is another view of this basically. You have the architectural state at the beginning of an instruction, you process part of the instruction one clock cycle, you move to another state, process another part of the instruction in the next clock cycle, you move to another state. Do this until you go through all of the states that you have designed to execute the instruction. And then you get architectural state prime at the end. It may take, in this case, if your instruction is very complicated, it may take a thousand states, a thousand clock cycles to finish it. If your instruction is very simple, it may take only a few clock cycles to finish it. Basically, each instruction takes as many clock cycles as it needs. It's a much more beautiful design. It obeys the principles that we've discussed earlier. And the principles are these, basically. Now, we can actually keep reducing the critical path independently of the worst case processing time of any instruction. We're not limited by this huge load. We can say, okay, my critical path, I'm going to design a machine that's 10 gigahertz, and I'm going to determine my states based on that. I'm gonna chop up the combination logic such that I can get to 10 gigahertz, right? And if an instruction takes 1,000 cycles to achieve that, it's gonna take 1,000 cycles. But hopefully most instructions like simple ads are not going to take that long. Now you can really optimize for clock cycle. That's the critical path design. And if you know, you can also optimize for the common case. If you know that your machine is going to execute lots of ads because people are doing lots of ads. If you know that your machine is going to execute lots of multiplies with a lot of machine learning applications, for example, you optimize for multiplies. And you can basically go through the state machine and go through your combination logic and basically optimize the number of states it takes to execute these important instructions that may make up much of your execution time. If multiplies consume 90% of your execution time, you go and reduce the number of states it takes to execute your multiply by changing your data path, changing your state machine, changing your control logic. Right. So you have a lot of freedom right now. You cannot do that in a single cycle machine. Uh, it's also a more balanced design. Basically, you don't need to provide more capability or resources than you really need in this case. Uh, why? Because an instruction that needs resource X multiple times doesn't require multiple Xs to be implemented. This could be an adder, it could be memory, because now you're sequencing through states. You don't need to do everything related to an instruction in a single cycle. If you, do, if you have to do everything related to an instruction in a single cycle, you need to provide all the resources that are needed in that cycle, and everything is combinational, so you cannot really, uh, you have no way around it. Whereas if you are taking multiple cycles to do things, you can have a single resource, a single ALU, and whenever you want to do an add, you go through that ALU. In fact, you don't need to have an adder for program counter in this case, right? Because you can use the ALU to do that add also, except you do it in different cycles. For example, if you're executing an add, you increment the program counter using the ALU. You just provide the data path and control elements to be able to do that. In some other cycle, you add the two registers that you're supposed to add, right? So you can get away with a single ALU actually in this case. And this leads to more efficient hardware because you can reuse hardware components that are needed multiple times for an instruction. Of course, for performance, you may not want to do that, but for 
simplicity, you can do that. Yes? So basically, uh, the execution time of a single instruction stays the same. You just chop it up into more pieces, so you don't have as much waiting time, right? You can, you can think of it that way, exactly. Yeah. Except we'll have overhead, as we will see. Okay. Overhead of latching, inter storing intermediate results. So it might be too easy, because here you have more uh, gigahertz, it doesn't mean that it's running faster. You just chop it up into more pieces. Smaller pieces, yes. Yes, basically, the latency of an instruction, assuming you don't change anything in the data path, stays the same, plus you will have some overhead because of the intermediate start result storage. But now you can optimize the clock cycle time and you can optimize the number of states. Okay, so there are clearly downsides uh, to a multi-cycle design. And we've discussed this actually in the previous lecture, one of your colleagues mentioned that you need to store the intermediate results at the end of each clock cycle. And we will see that, which means that you need to have hardware overhead to store these results. You need to have additional registers that you didn't need in a single cycle machine. And of course, you need to pay the latency cost for storing stuff into those registers, which means that you need to, you need to obey their setup on hold times, and you need to do it multiple times for a single instruction. So if an instruction takes a thousand clock cycles, a thousand times you need to write into a register and read from uh, that register. So that's additional latency that you add that didn't exist in a single cycle machine, right? Because we're storing results in an uh, intermediate uh, state. Okay, so that's clearly, uh, it's a hardware overhead, but it's also power overhead and energy overhead, so there needs to be cost-benefit analysis. But the key thing is, because we're able to get all of these benefits, multi-cycle designs are, uh, in general, much, much better and much more realistic. Okay, so remember the performance analysis. Let's get back to this. I've shown you this equation multiple times right now. So if you look at the single-cycle microarchitecture performance, CPI is one, clock cycle time is long, Actually, very long. Multi-cycle microarchitecture performance gives you freedom. Essentially, CPI is different for each instruction, but the average CPI is hopefully small, and you have the freedom to minimize the average CPI as much as possible, as much as you care to minimize it. And clock cycle time is hopefully short. Again, that's in your control also. You can say my clock cycle is going to be 100 gigahertz or 1 terahertz. Good luck building it, of course. But you could say that, and you could try to build that machine. Whereas you couldn't say that over here with a single cycle machine. So essentially you have two degrees of freedom to optimize independently. You can optimize the clock cycle time, you can optimize the cycle per instruction. Clearly when you reduce the clock cycle time, because the time it takes, assuming you don't change the data path significantly, the time it takes uh, to execute the instructions is the same, you'll increase the clock uh, cycles per instruction. So there's a trade-off between clock cycle time and cycles per instruction. And you need to be careful. There's also overhead as you reduce the clock cycle time, you need to have more overhead, and that overhead increases the latency to process each instruction. Oh, and clearly, in single cycle microarchitecture, it's not easy to optimize the design. So let's take a closer look into this multi-cycle microarchitecture, just like we had a closer look into the single cycle microarchitecture. Uh, actually, this is uh, Maurice Wilkes. He actually is the father of microarchitecture, if you will, and as you can see, he gave this lecture about the best way to design an automatic calculating machine. That's a bit aggressive, I think. Maybe people have discovered other better ways, but at that point in time, he thought this was the best way. And this is really referring to a multi-cycle microarchitecture. So he has an elegant implementation. If you're really interested, I would uh, recommend you take a look at it. Basically, he came up with the concept of micro-coded microprogram machines that you're reading in your Appendix C. Uh, basically, the key idea for realization is this. One can implement the process instruction step as a finite state machine that sequences between states and eventually returns to back to the fetch instruction state. We're going to see this. We're going to construct this finite state machine basically for the thing that uh, the, the machine that you have in your book. A state is defined by the control signals that are asserted in it. So you can distinguish a state by looking at the control signals. So each state has unique control signals. And control signals for the next state are determined in the current state. Not all of them. Some of them may need to be determined in the state itself, as we've seen with the branch condition. But you could actually change the number of states you have to ensure that control signals that you need in the next state are determined in the previous state by always adding more states. Right? That way you can also reduce your critical path if your control store takes long, or if your control signals take long to generate. So basically, this is the instruction processing cycle we have. We're going to chop it up into states, and each instruction will go through different states. 
Uh, this doesn't mean that you have only six states clearly, right? Uh, you can chop up fetch into multiple states. I mean, you've seen that actually. You can chop up execute into 10 different states depending on what you're doing in execu execution, right? Okay, so instruction processing cycle is divided into states. A stage in the instruction processing cycle can take multiple states, as I said. A multi-cycle microarchitecture sequences from state to state to process the instruction. And the behavior of the machine in a state is completely de determined by, defined by the control signals in that state. This is the importance of control. In fact, if two states have exactly the same control signals, they're equivalent states. You can merge them in the finite state machine. Uh, and the behavior of the entire processor is specified fully by a finite state machine, which you know how to build. So in a, in a state or clock cycle, control signals control two different things. How the data path should control the data, that should process the data, like which MUXs should be connected, uh, which, what should the ALU do if the ALU is relevant in that state, uh, whether the program counter should be updated or not, all of those control signals. And you also generate the control signals for the next clock cycle. Now you may actually generate the control signals earlier also. Uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about pipelining especially. But basically you need to generate the control signals at some point before you get to uh, the, the next state where you need the control signals. Okay, now we're going to go through an example multi-cycle microarchitecture. And we're gonna start with this example. This is a bit simpler. That's why I picked this one, but it's essentially similar to what you've covered. This is directly from your book. This is a single cycle MIPS processor. And it actually has the jumps also. You can see the uh, two, um, two MUXs uh, that are controlled. One is controlled by the jump over here, uh, and the other is controlled by the branch condition over here, as you can see. So it's very similar to what we've looked at in detail, and I, you've already seen this mostly. So this is very quickly, again, single cycle microarchitecture. You get to have low clock frequency, high hardware costs. We want to get rid of that. We want high clock frequency, uh, hopefully low hardware cost. We use expensive hardware across multiple cycles, and simpler instructions run faster. But the downsides, don't ever forget the downsides. It's always a trade-off. Uh, you have sequencing overhead you, that you pay many times. You have additional latency to finish an instruction because you need to store the intermediate results. And you also have a hardware overhead for storing intermediate results. But if you want to design a multi-cycle machine, you go through essentially the same steps we did for a single cycle machine. You need to design the data path and you need to design the control logic. In this case, control logic will be a finite state machine uh, where you assert the control signals. But it's going to be very, very similar to the single cycle design, except we're gonna chop up things into stages. So once you know single cycle design, it's very easy to go to the next step. So we also want to optimize something. Single cycle architecture uses two memories. One memory stores instructions, the other data. We want to use a single memory. You could do that also. Uh, single cycle architecture needs three adders, uh, ALU, program counter adder, and branch address calculation adder, if you remember. You can use the ALU for all operations, that way you get smaller size. I mentioned this earlier, right? In one cycle, you increment the PC, in the next cycle, you do the ALU operation, or in some other cycle, because you've decided your finite state machine. You design your finite state machine, because then you have that freedom to use the ALU for whatever purpose you like. Well, clearly, uh, this is not possible in a single cycle uh, architecture, as we've discussed. I'm not gonna uh, talk about that, uh, because we already talked about it. So let's take a look at the load word instruction. How do we actually implement in a multi-cycle machine? So we'll start with this load word. It's basically base plus offset addressing, as you know, and the destination register. And we need to go through all of these steps. You need to read the instruction from memory, read uh, T1, the base address, from the registers, add the immediate value to calculate the memory address to the register, uh, read the content of that address from memory and write to register T0 in this case. So you can start the same way we started. Basically, first you need to fetch the instruction. And we're going to say that this is our clock cycle. Uh, basically, this happens in one clock cycle. Basically, you input the PC to the instruction slash data memory right now. And you get the result out and put it into a, an intermediate register. So we introduce this register, as you can see, that's a register that's between fetch and decode. We can call it a fetch decode register. Now it houses the instruction that you fetched. And that is your clock cycle in this case. Well, we're gonna add more uh, combination logic and more registers, so eventually you'll need to do the critical path analysis across the entire machine, of course. But 
now we, uh, we can actually store the result, last year result at the end of the clock cycle. That's step one. Next step, you read the register file and store the result into another intermediate register at the end of the register file. Make sense? And concurrently, we, have, we compute the sign extend immediate. Because this reading takes long, we decided to store the result over here. And what you need to do is to evaluate the address. Uh, in the next cycle, you take the address from here and you take uh, the uh, bottom uh, 16 bits, sign extend them, and input to the other part of the ALU, the other input of the ALU. You set the ALU control accordingly and store the result into another intermediate register. So now we've added one, two, three intermediate registers, right? Okay. And then you do the memory read. Basically, this is our effective address in this register. In the next cycle, you take the effective address, input into the same memory. Of course, you need to add the data path element to say, okay, in this cycle, I should take, if, if, I'm, if I'm in this state, I should really take this value through this mux. So this I or D signal should be D in this particular state of the state machine so that I can use the address in the load word instruction to access memory and get the data out and store it into another intermediate register. Make sense? So basically, we've broken things into multiple clock cycles such that we don't have to do everything in a single clock cycle. And then in the next stage, uh, next, next cycle, we basically take the data and write it into a, a register that's specified by this stuff that we stored in that intermediate register, right? And that stuff indicates which register ID. And that was the instruction, if you remember, we stored the instruction. Uh, when we fetched the instruction, we stored in this particular intermediate register. And we're going to use that value over there to decide which register ID we actually uh, store this data that we just fetched and stored into this intermediate register. And of course, in this particular state, you need to set the reg-write signal to one. So there needs to be, in the state machine, when you're moving from state to state, you need to set the signals, control signals appropriately so that every single state does what you intend to do to execute this instruction. We're going to build that state machine a little bit. Okay. Are we done? We're not done. The other thing that load word needs to do is to increment the PC. And this is one way of doing it. Basically, remember the uh, PC is already here. We take the program counter and essentially input it into the ALU. And we take four input it into the ALU. So we basically add PC plus four. And I didn't talk about all of the other things that are needed, but ALU actually is used for everything in this multi-cycle machine. We don't want to have different adders to minimize the hardware we have. So we're using the ALU to compute PC plus four in that cycle. And that's how you do it. You set the ALU source A mux signal to zero and ALU, uh, so that you select program counter as, an as one input to the ALU. You set the ALU source B mux to zero one so that we select uh, four a hardwired value for as the other input to the ALU. And the ALU, of course, this, this also needs to be blue and it needs to say ALU control needs to do add basically in this case. And then the result comes out of ALU result and it goes to the program counter. And you basically all of this is done in one cycle. But what we've done right now is we're using ALU in an earlier cycle to calculate the address. If you go back over here, we use the same ALU to calculate the address. In an earlier cycle, we had the address, we used that address to access memory, we got the data, and we did stuff with it. And in a later cycle, we use the ALU to actually increment the PC. That's what you can do if you actually chop things up into multiple states and multiple cycles. Clearly, you can think right now, oh, I can optimize this actually. Whenever I'm not using the ALU, I can do this increment. So now you can actually reduce the number of cycles you take the execute. And you can also, uh, but of course you need to add these other data path elements. So this is a minimal design. Of course, if you want to, um, you can always add another adder over here to increment the PC that, and specialize that adder to do the PC plus four, right? But there's nothing that prevents you from doing that, but that's additional hardware cost. In this case, uh, we're, re we're reducing the hardware cost 
but we are adding more muxes, as you can see, right? If you want to input the PC into this ALU, you need to add this mux, because uh, the other input of the ALU needs to come from the source register one over here. And this mux needs to be extended. The ALU gets input from the register file to from the sign extend immediate, from plus four, and maybe other things. Okay, so let's, let's say uh, this is our load word. This is the data path that you need for a load word. It's relatively minimal. I don't think you can minimize it even more. Uh, how do you do store word? Well, store word is now easy to add. It's clearly, store word needs to fetch the instruction, uh, get the data out of the register file, and after getting the data out of the register file, you store it over here, and then you take this and have a path to write it to memory. Now what we've done is interesting over here. Store word, uh, actually uh, load word needs a source register uh, to be uh, put into this intermediate register, uh, intermediate, uh, uh, yeah, flip-flop, and then you use that to calculate the address. Store word needs to do all of that, plus whenever you read the register file, you also need to get uh, the data that you want to write to memory. So we extended this intermediate register so it doesn't just latch one of the source register, but it latches the other source register as well, because you need that to be able to put it, uh, to be able to update memory. So this is the only additional thing that you need to be able to do store word on top of what we've implemented for load word, because store word goes through, fetches the data from, uh, fetches the instruction from instruction slash data memory in this case, fetches one of the source registers, fetches the, uh, the other source register, uh, and then calculate the address, and we know how to do that. It's very similar to load word. We just need to extend this register so that we can keep this second source register and then write it to memory. And in that particular state where the store word needs to write to memory, you set the memory write signal to one. Okay? Okay, now let's take, let's add our type instructions. And this is the additional stuff that you need for our type instructions. Yes? Exactly, yeah. You basically connect uh, everything to high, uh, yeah, VDD. <laughs> okay, so the uh, store word we've seen, our type instructions, actually our type instructions, we, uh, we already have almost all the circuitry to do it. Remember, load word was relatively similar to I type actually, uh, but we have our, our type instructions here. Uh, so uh, our type to be able to do our type instructions, we already have the machinery to store our regist register one and register two over here, uh, and the second register into the ALU should come from this input of the MUX, and we need to be able to write uh, to the appropriate destination register, right? And this is the MUX. This is very similar to the MUX we had in the single cycle microarchitecture. There's nothing different. Destination register should be, uh, ID should be coming from either bits 20 through 16 of the instruction, or bits 15 through 11 of the instruction. And depending on the instruction type, you choose the right one. And this is the, exactly the same signal, control signal that we have in the single cycle microarchitecture. And this register is, uh, this MUX is also exactly the same MUX that we have in the single cycle microarchitecture because the input to the register file that you're supposed to be updating can come from either the ALU results, well, it's coming from the latch in this case, ALU out over here, or it could come from memory, which is coming from this latch over here, this intermediate register. So it's basically, it's very similar hardware in the end, it's a bit less hardware, and you'll have these additional registers, and you need to basically orchestrate where the inputs come from and when the inputs are latched into these additional registers. So that's our type instructions. I type you can do on your own. BEQ, again, it's very similar hardware. Uh, basically, you determine whether values in RS and RT are equal. You do that through the... ALU, and we already have the path to be able to do that. We read the source register, we read the second source register, we compare them. If the zero bit or branch condition bit is equal to one, and if this is a branch and this is a branch, so that's coming from the control logic that's not shown here, uh, this becomes a one, and uh, that's the PC write signal. If this is a one, you update the program counter. So now we have enables into the registers. We didn't necessarily uh, need them in a single cycle microarchitecture. Actually, we didn't need them in a single cycle microarchitecture because you're always updating uh, the architectural state at the end of the clock cycle, right? There's no need for enable signals. Now we need to 
decide when we update the program counter, when we update uh, this register, when we update this other register. And you need to, of course, provide the path to be able to supply uh, the uh, branch offset. And branch offset is uh, calculated through here. Yeah. OK. And this is the complete multi-cycle processor that we have. Essentially, it's very similar to the single cycle, but we're a little bit leaner because we have only a single ALU over here. We don't have a separate instruction data memories. And uh, we have these, uh, it's, also, it's also not linear because we need to store the intermediate results that we need to latch at the end of a given clock cycle depending on how our state machine is designed. And you need to clearly uh, uh, design the control unit. And control unit essentially is designed very similarly. Uh, but now we're going to design the finite state machine because uh, we, we sequence from state to states. In, in a single cycle machine, you basically look at the instruction register and you can generate your control signals. Now, we have a finite state machine that goes from state to state, so we're, we're going to orchestrate how to generate the control signals for that finite state machine. So let me go through that. So this is our control unit, essentially. Uh, it takes the opcode and it gives you all of these control signals that we have, and some of them are new. For example, because we're using the uh, instruction and data memory in a combined way, we have this I or D mux, if you remember. Where is it? It's this mux over here, then that's the I or D signal. Whether you're accessing for instructions, whether you're accessing for data, the address either comes from the PC or comes from the ALU result that's latched in the previous cycle. Uh, so you have some more signals over here uh, because of uh, what I just said. And also these IR writes, mem writes, these are actually uh, the registers that we introduced. So this is IR write, for example. Well, mem write is mem write. Uh, so some of the registers you need to control. And we have also a PC write or PC enable signal that, uh, that is controlled partially by the PC write signal. So we have some more control signals, uh, but essentially it's the same. And for, uh, ALU op over here specifies uh, what should the ALU do. So that's our control unit. Now let's build a finite state machine. Uh, essentially, you need to have states in this finite state machine to execute all of the instructions. Let's do the fetch. So fetch is common to all instructions. Uh, normally you start, uh, remember that we have reset states in our finite state machine. This is a state where we start from. And how do we fetch an instruction? Basically you need to set the control signals appropriately. And these are the control signals. You see some of them. If you read your book, you'll see. Basically IRD should be zero so that we get the program counter into, uh, as an address into the instruction slash data memory. And that's all we need to do, basically. And the, we get the data out of the instruction slash data memory, which is an instruction in this case, because we use the program counter. And then we need to store it in this, uh, in this uh, intermediate register. To be able to do that, we set IR write to one. So in this case, IRD is zero, IR write is one. And uh, everything else is zero. Now we could update the program counter also in this case, uh, and this actually does update the program counter with PC plus four. So that's another thing that you can do because you, you just can't do it, right? You can, you can actually update the program counter. So basically that's what we do in this fetch stage. Uh, this is how you set the control signals to be, able, to be able to do that. So you set ALU source B to zero one so that we can update the program counter by four. You set ALU source A to be zero so that we can get program counter into the ALU as a second input. And the ALU does an add. So ALU op is uh, zero, zero, which translates into an add over here based on, let me go back over here. So this is zero, zero, and you get the function. ALU control gives you an add in this case. So there's some other control logic over there. Uh, and Everything else should be do no harm, basically. So of course you need to set the PC source to uh, the appropriate uh, MUX as well. So this is not a branch, so that should be zero. Uh, and PC write should be one, so that we increment the PC by four. So that's our fetch state, basically. We designed it. We, what we wanted to do in the state is to get the instruction out, uh, specified by the address in the PC uh, from memory, latch it into this intermediate register, and we also wanted to increment the PC in the same clock cycle. So at the, at the end of the clock cycle, 
this PC should contain PC plus four, and we should have the instruction in what's called the IR, instruction register, over here. Make sense? To be able to do that, you design the state, and you ensure that the appropriate control signals are set so that the machine does what you want it to do in that particular state. Okay, now we fetch the instruction. The instruction is sitting here. What's the next state? Well, next state is decode, right? So the machine moves unconditionally to the next state, which is decode. This, is, this happens uh, with a clock edge. And now you need to decode the instruction. So what do we need to do in decode? Let's take a look quickly. Uh, well, I think I'll let you do that. But basically, you determine all of these control signals. So decode is actually relatively simple. Basically, you need to do no harm. You shouldn't update memory clearly in the decode stage. You shouldn't update PC. So all of those need to be zero. So the, the signals are actually set correctly over here. But you also have don't cares. Right here, you don't care what's the output because you're not going to write into the instruction registry. You already fetched the instruction. And the decode stage has nothing to do with accessing memory. So these are all, this is don't care, this is zero. Uh, the decode stage does, shouldn't update the PC, that should be a zero. The decode stage doesn't really care about what happens here, so these are all X's as you can see. So you set your control signal accordingly. The, also the decode stage shouldn't write to a register, so this write enables should be zero over here. That's true for the fetch stage also. Basically do no harm in a state that where you're not updating registers or memory, and that principle still holds, and everything else where uh, the control signals don't matter, you can set them to X. So there are a lot of X's in the decode state, as you can see. Because at the end of the decode state, what we get is the read, uh, the registers that we read into uh, this particular intermediate register between decode and ALU, as you can see. So that's some, there's something interesting that's happening here. Basically, you read the registers based on what's in the instruction, right? These bits specify the register that you read, register one. These bits specify the, the second register that you read, and they both get lashed. They may not be used later, because you don't really know the instruction at this point. You're figuring out what's the instruction uh, while you're decoding, and some of these signals are being set while you're decoding. But you, you also read the register file concurrently. Okay, what's the next state? Well, now it depends. Now the next transition is conditional. And we're going to look at one example. This is load word and store word. So if the op operation that you have over here that's coming out of the instruction register is load word or store word, you jump into, you, uh, the, the finite state mo machine moves into this state. What is that state? Well, we named it as S2 memory address calculation state. So what do you do? You basically set the control signals accordingly so that you calculate the memory address as specified by load word or store word. Well, how do you do that? Well, it's already set over here. Basically, how do you do that? So you have the register one over here, source register, and the second source register over here. The address calculation takes the top source register, so you need to set the signal for this MUX to one so that you get that into the ALU. Uh, the address calculation also gets from the instruction register the bottom 16 bits, sign extended, and you take that, you do the addition, and you get the ALU results, and they get slashed in the next cycle over here. And of course, you need to ensure that the ALU does the right thing, which is an addition. So basically, you need to set the control signals accordingly so that you do this, and everything else should do no harm. Don't update the PC, don't update the memory, don't update the register file, because we're not in that state where the load word should update the register file yet. In this state, we're just calculating the memory address. And this state will take as long as the combination logic maximum combination log logic delay that is required to calculate the memory address. Okay? So what's the next state after this? Well, okay, you can study this. I've already said most of this. Well, the next state is actually interesting because now we're going to branch again. So both load word and stored word calculate the memory address, and after that they differ from each other. Load word, if, if the operation is a load word, you get into some other state called memory where you set the control signals accordingly to read from memory and put the data into an intermediate register. And then uh, if you're in this state, the next state is unconditionally the memory write back state because now you read the memory, you need to write the value into a register and you set the control signals accordingly in the state to write into a register. And I'll let you study that. It's very simple, very similar to what you've done with a single cycle microarchitecture, except we're doing different things at different states, not everything in a single cycle. And then, once you're done, you're written to the register, 
What is the next state? Well, the next state is you're done with the load instruction. So you go back to the fetch state so that you can fetch the next instruction. You remember this loop in the instruction processing cycle? We're basically executing this loop. And this is just load. Well, how do you do the store? While you're in this state, uh, based on the op that you have, let me go back, op is here, if you remember. It's coming, basically, basically it's the op code. Based on the op code, you check if it's loadword or storeword. If it's storeword, you go into a memwrite state. And you set the control signals as accordingly so that the register that you read in this particular, actually in this state, in the decode state, gets written to the memory at the address that you've calculated in the memory address state and that you've stored into the intermediate registers. And you're done with the store at this point. What is the next state? The next state is fetch again, and you go to the next instruction. Now we know how to, this, this finite state machine is complete in executing stores and loads, assuming the data path that I've designed. But of course, we don't have just loads and stores. Now, if you want to keep adding instructions, we just keep adding states. So let's go back to this decode. If we were load word, if we had an opcode that's load word or store word, we jumped into this state. Well, if it's an R type operation, we jump into some other state. The next state that comes after decode is the execute state, where we basically, in the decode, we already fetched the two registers that are needed by the R type operation. And those registers are input into the ALU, so you need to set the appropriate ALU si source signals. First source of the ALU should come from the top register. The second source should come from the bottom register. And the ALU itself needs to do the operation that's specified by the function of the R-type instruction. And you're done, basically. That's the end of the execute stage uh, state. And you have the results stored in the register at the end of the ALU. So let's go back to the data path. At the end of that state, the result is lashed into this ALU result uh, register, which I didn't name over here. Okay, and now the next state is unconditionally this ALU write back state, where you take the result in that, in that register and store it into the destination register. And how do you do that? Again, you set the control signals accordingly to accomplish that in this state. So if you look over here, the, each state has a unique set of control signals. In fact, that's the definition of a state, if you will. You, we've designed the states to do stuff that we want to do during the processing of an instruction, and those states are uniquely identifiable based on the unique control signals that they assert. So the control signals that you assert in this state is different from the control signals that you assert in this state, is different from the control signals that you assert in this state. That's how you can minimize the number of states also. If two states have exactly the same control signals, you can actually merge them. Okay, so that's the end of the R-type instruction. And now, once you're written to the register in the state, the next state is unconditionally again, fetch. Sounds good, right? So, if you want to add a branch, which you need to if you're designing a MIPS machine, after decode, you check the opcode. If the opcode is branch, you go into the, the state that you transition into is this state. And it turns out, Branch can take only one cycle to execute after decode. Uh, basically, you need to set the sources appropriately so that you calculate the branch condition. You need to set the PC source appropriately so that you get the right target. And of course, uh, part of the control signals uh, is determined by based on the branch condition. Uh, and at the end of this, the PC is updated. So the PC is updated based on this PC enable, which is, uh, really coming from this branch, as you can see over here. Okay, so essentially you update the program counter over here, uh, or not update the program counter based on uh, whether or not you're really branching, because we've already updated the program counter to PC plus four before over here. Okay, so we're almost done. This is not complete. This is complete for the instructions we have. But if you want to add more states here, you can, you're free to do so. You can add, a, add immediate, for example, right? So this is the beauty of this design. Now you can keep adding states. As long, if your data path is capable of executing that instruction by manipulating the control signals, you can keep adding many, many instructions here. So you can actually use this to do something like repeat move S potentially, which is a string copy operation, by looping through different states. Right? So add I is, of course, not as complicated, but you add two states. 
And if you want to, so some instructions you may not be able to uh, execute with the data path elements you have. So the data path we have so far can do all of this, but it cannot do jump. So if you want to add that instruction, well, you need to add some more data path elements because this didn't exist before. Jump requires another target address to be possibly input into the PC. And you basically add the data path element that's needed. And we know what that is. Basically, you need to be able to calculate the address uh, in a particular way, which is essentially bottom 26 bits concatenating with the uh, shifted left, concatenated with the top four bits. And you need that to be input into the PC source mux over here. So you extend the PC source mux, and you need to have the appropriate control signal extended. And now you've added stuff to the data path. You add the appropriate state to the finite state machine, and that's it. Now you're able to execute the jump. If you want to add different instructions, you change your data path, you change your finite state machine, you change your control, uh, control logic as needed. So now you can look at this and you can say, okay, how long does a jump instruction take to execute? One, you need to fetch it, you need to decode it, you need to have one state to execute it, three cycles. How long does uh, a load word take to execute? You need to fetch it, you need to decode it, you need to calculate the memory address, you need to do the memory read, you need to do the memory write back, so it's five cycles. So you've saved essentially two cycles when you're executing a jump because you don't need to be bottlenecked by how long a load word takes to execute, which we determined to be the bottleneck in the single cycle design, right? How long does an ad take to execute? Well, it depends on the ad. Uh, well, I guess it doesn't depend on the ad. Ad I takes one, two, three, four cycles in this case, and add register type ad, R type ad takes also four cycles in the end. A branch takes three cycles, a store takes one, two, three, four cycles. Clearly, if you want to increase your frequency, you can add more states uh, over here. And that's our single, this was our single cycle MIPS processor, and this is our multi-cycle MIPS processor. It's very similar again, but uh, we control it using a finite state machine that looks like this. So I'll ask you the question, what is the shortcoming of this design? Any guesses? Yes? Yeah, so basically your throughput may reduce, that's right, because uh, you're, you're still finishing one instruction after some number of cycles, and we've added overhead. So we're gonna fix that when we talk about pipelining. Uh, but there's also some other shortcoming, that's very good. So we're gonna motivate pipelining so that we can restore throughput. But this design also assumes something about memory. It, memory takes one cycle. But if you have a finite state machine, it's beautiful. You can actually fix that problem. What if memory takes more than one cycle? Well, what you do is you stay in the memory access state until memory says, I'm done, right? It's very hard to do that in a single cycle machine. So basically, this is the fetch state. You're waiting for memory. Memory takes, let's say, 10 cycles. Okay, I add another transition over here. If the memory is not ready, I stay in the state. When the memory is ready, I transition to the state. So you have a conditional transition. So that's the beauty of the finite state machine. And that's where we stop over here. In the next lecture, we'll improve the throughput with pipelining. Have a good weekend.